science, science class. Um, we are going to talk about science. Um, we're going to talk about what it is and how you can use it. I want to keep this video fairly brief um, so that we can, so it can be easy to share and, and to look. So, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I uh, was trying to get my PowerPoint to share properly, and I don't think I succeeded. I can do it, but not in full screen because I don't know what's wrong with my computer. If anyone is a Mac expert, please call us and help me to figure this out. Okay. So welcome to the scientific method. So glad for you to join us. Pretend we are in science class um, because, you know, that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to see if I can share this PowerPoint presentation. I just threw together a few slides because there are a lot of words and it would just be fun to have the slides. And it may be weird and maybe we won't do it, but we are going to talk about science today. What, what is science? Because science, that word is getting thrown around a whole lot recently. And there's maybe a different definition of science than maybe what we're hanging into. So um, let's get this going. So let me see if I can get this to share the scientific method. All right, well, we're going to see it just with my few slides like this. And that's the best I can get. So, so sorry. All right, scientific method. I tried to make it look like school because that's fun. And let me get to <coughs> be able to advance my slide. And here, hopefully, it worked. I don't know if this is worth it. We shall see. Okay, so the scientific method. There are six steps to the scientific method. Why are we talking about the scientific method? because science is getting thrown around. Also why we're talking about the scientific method, because it's, in, it's important. Okay, I'm actually gonna spoil the rest of my thing, so I won't. There's six steps to the scientific method. I don't know if you can see these at all, but I will read them. Step number one, you are curious. You ask a question about something. I wonder why, I was gonna say why the sky is blue. You could be curious about that, and there are um, scientific, uh, studies that you can propose and there's ways that we figured out why that is. That one's probably a little bit complicated. You could figure out why you sleep better on Friday nights instead of Sunday nights. That's a great question. Why is that? Why are you sleeping um, better on Friday nights than Sunday nights? Okay, so then you do research. Second step of scientific method is researching. Start understanding your subject. You may understand about your sleep patterns and you might have a hypothesis from there, but you don't maybe don't know very much about sleep. Um, maybe you think alcohol might have a component. So do you drink alcohol or not? What kind of foods, what time of night, right? Um, that you eat dinner and how that affects your sleep. How stressed were you through the week, right? There's lots of things, but you can save yourself a lot of revisiting the hypothesis and testing by doing research because that's going to inform your next step which is the hypothesis create a hypothesis hypothesis is also called an educated guess hypotheses or educated guesses are things that we come up with an answer that we think is probable based on our research and knowledge of the question that we asked okay so in this case, you think on Fridays, I am done with my week. And on Sundays, I'm thinking about Monday. So I think I sleep better on Sundays than I do on Fridays. You also hypothesize in that, that it does not have anything to do with your alcohol consumption or does not have anything to do with what time of you eat dinner or anything like that, right? So you come up with a hypothesis and then you design and conduct an experiment. So what could be an experiment? What if you shifted the shifts, <laughs> switched the shifts at your work so that you actually worked Saturday and Sunday and not Monday and Tuesday, right? So then you could start determining, do you sleep better on Sunday night when it's the end of your work week, um, right? So you could do things like that. You could also have the hypothesis that alcohol does not affect your sleep. So then you would do two weeks of no alcohol or a month of no alcohol, alcohol, and then a month of alcohol every night and see if alcohol is affecting your sleep, right? You could vary the time of your dinner. You could 
you know, um, do meditation before bed every night to see if that changed your stress level, right? So you conduct an experiment at, that you design to see what the results are. Number five, analyze the results. This is very important because you need to stop and sit down and think what actually happened and what didn't happen. So if you are like, I just think alcohol affects it, right? Well, you're no better off than when you just already guessed that alcohol didn't or did affect it, right? You need to actually take, keep notes, take, um, take notes, keep track every single day um, with your variables that you only change one at a time and find out which ones have the effect on your sleep, right? You need to analyze that. That's what statistics are. <coughs> now, as we have recently been learning, statistics can be manipulated, right? But you actually want to know the truth, which is the point of the scientific method, is to discover the truth about an answer. You want an answer that is true. Um, because you want to sleep better every single night. So you want to figure out how to do that, right? <clears throat> so you analyze it accurately without inflating or interpreting differently. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to go back through these in detail. <clears throat> and then you draw your conclusion. So eventually you decide, is your hypothesis valid or not valid? If your hypothesis that you wrote down at the beginning was I believe that alcohol does not affect my sleep. Then you did a hypothesis. You designed an experiment. Um, sorry, that was your hypothesis. You designed an experiment. You analyzed the results. And you found that you do not sleep any differently whether you drink alcohol for a month, the month you drank alcohol, or the month you didn't drink alcohol every night, right? So you found that result out. And you determined that alcohol does not, in fact, affect your sleep. So that's your conclusion. If your hypothesis would, I'm lost my hypothesis. If your hypothesis was proven wrong, you would then have a new hypothesis. Okay, that doesn't affect my sleep. I think my sleep is affected by stress. And I think that stress will be relieved by meditation before bed. So it's very important to differentiate in the scientific method that you have to first ask a question and then you state a thing that you're going to prove to be true or false. So a lot of times we will think of science as asking a question and then researching it, right? And in this context, in the slide I have here, research means you did study about other people's studies. Experimenting is what we really mean often when we say research, right? So when you say, here's my question, let's research about it or let's experiment about it, that's kind of what you mean, right? And then you just see what the results are. Do you see how studying through each single step of the scientific method actually helps you not miss things or draw um, like uh, assumptions, right? You can't draw assumptions here because it doesn't let you. Um, an assumption method would be ask a question, assume that you, you know, Draw a hypothesis, which we would just call an assumption. We think we're right about something, or we think this is how it works. And then we research and observe in a non-scientific way and not a method. <clears throat> and then we determine that we were right or wrong, right? Well, that is not, it's, it's just not structured enough. There's easy for your bias or your interpretation bias to be in play there. You. For example, when you buy a car, you find that you find all the other cars that are like your car that you never knew. You would say, man, nah, there's two cars like this one. I've never seen a car like this before, right? And then you buy it and you find out a lot of people are driving the same car as you, right? So observation bias, when you have already an idea in your head, would not allow you to come to a true conclusion because of that, right? So the scientific method helps you to stop the observation bias. All right, let me get back to my thing. I don't know if PowerPoint's worth it if I can't figure out how to do this. All right, who can do science? <laughs> These are just the very old word method uh, pictures. So I hope that you enjoy them. Um, who can do science? Science can be done by doctors and graduate students. 
Well, yes, but who else can do science? Anyone, anyone can do science because that process I just described is in the curriculum I was, I did growing up. That was taught in at least fifth grade. I believe we were also taught it in third grade, maybe even earlier, but <clears throat> that there is a huge amount of exploring science and exploring God's world with the Becca curriculum is what I did in fifth grade, right? So fifth graders can do this. You can do it. There's no reason why we have to leave science to the scholars and doctors and, you know, health professionals, right? This is a process that we can do. Now, you may say, I don't have access to the data of the thousands of hundreds of thousands of people or whatever, which is true, right? <clears throat> but you do have access to the data. You can't design an experiment to that extent, but you actually have access to data and can do the rest of this um, on your own. So let's go to the next slide, which is what is true? Before we go on, let's really talk about the definition of science we have been using in our world versus the definition of science as a process. So the scientific method or what we shorten as science is really what science is about. Science is exploring questions and trying to find answers about what is true as a principle. When a principle is true, it is always true. Water is always wet. That's a bad example. People debate about that. But water is always wet. Ice is always cold, right? Um, uh, trees always grow up. You know, there's exceptions, of course, in those. And so trees always grow up is not an actual true principle because trees do not always grow up. They sometimes grow sideways or upside down or loop to loop, right? Um, rocks are harder than feathers. That's a, that's a true statement, right? So what is really, really cool about science and scientific method and finding things that are true are you are searching for, and what science is, is searching for the answer of truth, not how to manipulate the data to be something that helps your, your cause, right? Um, and that is the definition that's been used. Science is been thrown in our faces as I did the science, so you have to accept it. Science is not accepting. Science is constantly questioning because if something is true, you can question it a hundred times and it still will be true. If you're not allowed to question something, it's not science because it doesn't matter. There should be no fear in science. If you did the scientific method, and truly want to find the true answer, which is what science is, you will want to find the truth. So if you're wrong, you want someone to tell you you're wrong. If you believe that trees always grow up and they don't always grow up, you should be excited when you find out that you were wrong and that you can find a more true hypothesis. So that is one of the heart, the, the, uh, emotional or heart signs that we can notice with people who are talking to us. How do they feel about what we have now defined as science? Science is searching for the truth and the principles in a situation. So when someone will does not believe in that definition of science, then they're not a scientist. That's a really bold statement, but that's true. By definition of what science is, um, science is trying to figure out the true principles around of the world around you. If you are only interested in figuring out things that fit your data points, then that's, that's not science. You're not a scientist. And there have been a lot of examples. This is not the only time this has happened. The other one that comes to mind a lot is Ansel Keys. So Ansel Keys had a hypothesis called the heart healthy hypothesis, which interestingly is still called the heart healthy hypothesis. Do you know why? Because it was never proven to be true. But he was so biased in his decision that the hypothesis was true that he actually falsified data nationally to, I mean, ultimately to Congress um, to have his heart healthy hypothesis be accepted. He did a quote seven country study, which actually was a 20 country study. And he only showed the seven countries out of 20 that fit his data points of the conclusion that he wanted because it is, it's going to always be manipulated. 
that is not a scientist. He did not do the scientific method. His research does not show up. And here is what is, so here's some more words about true. What is true? What is a principle that stays true? This has to be a principle or a hypothesis will be correct if it is demonstrable. You can demonstrate it, not just believe me, right? So back to our example of, I think alcohol affects my sleep, or I don't think alcohol affects my sleep. Have you demonstrated that? Have you done a method of experimentation to see if that's true? Otherwise, you are just talking. There's no science to that. That's just a hypothesis. It is an assumption, right? So it has to be demonstrable. You have to do experiments that create results. And those results have to be repeatable. You have to get multiple experiments designed potentially different ways or done by different people. If you say all people do this, then you have to do that repeatable, demonstratable experiment in countries around the world to get a representation of all people. Um, if you say all little boys love the color blue more than anything else, you have to do a demonstrable um, survey or study or experiment to ask little boys their favorite color all over the world, right? So it has to be demonstrable, it has to be repeatable, and you have to be able to observe it. This one is hard in some of the sciences that we do in natural health. Um, observable doesn't have to mean that you understand all the complex chemistry because that's not going to happen. Our bodies are so complex, I'm very convinced that we, at the most and peak of our knowledge, of demonstrable, meaning you can see it and we know which chemicals do what in what order, probably one to 10 being highly generous, but probably one to 5% of our human bodies, I think we will ever understand even at the peak of our knowledge and understanding, like how it actually works. But it doesn't mean you can't observe it. So we can observe how the human body functions by doing experiments about whatever. So if a body doesn't sleep for 72 hours, what happens to it? What do your eyes look like? How is your speech? Are you stuttering, right? If you drink this much alcohol, what? I don't know if I'm, I'm on alcohol tonight, but if you drink this much alcohol and your blood alcohol level, which is observable, right, is this amount, what is your speech sound like? And what does your action sound like? And what point does it cause death? You can observe all those things and they will be demonstrable in an experiment and repeatable over and over because there is a blood alcohol level that is fatal. It may be slightly different for other people about when you slur your speech or when you act drunk, right? But there is a fatal blood alcohol that will be fatal for all people. Some people might be fatal earlier than that, but there is a like set point. There is a set point for our body temperature to be too cold or too hot to survive you know, and not be alive. There is a um, acid base balance. There is an oxygen level that is necessary for life, right? So there's all these things that are observable. Um, you may not have the tools to do some of them, but you sure can have tools to do most of them. If you give your kids red dye number five, how do they act? That's observable, right? You don't need to be a scientist to know that. You can determine what things are healthy and good for your body, your children's body, um, and what is safe, right? And so one of the biggest things is there is data points that we don't know in kind of an observable big picture. Like you can't do a study around the world to see if boys' favorite color is blue or not, unless you have a lot of resources. Maybe you can, right? But most of us can't do that. But you could do a survey to see um, if the people who live in your small town at your kid's school, all the boys' favorite colors, blue or not, right? So it depends on what your hypothesis is. It depends on what your question is. Um, so you can decide whether your children can tolerate red dye number five or whether they do better with, with or without sugar or whatever, right? So there's all of that that you can observe. <clears throat> and because of the way that the media and um, scientists have been probably just trying to save their jobs as their like their exclusive jobs, right? Because we all do that. <clears throat> they have made science be this unreachable thing that scientists do, that experts do, right? No, that's not what the scientific method is. And so that's what I want to talk about. That's why I'm here today because I'm so passionate about that. 
you can do science. Everyone can do science. Okay, so science is demonstrable, repeatable, and observable. Let's, so this is just a little kind of teaser at the end, but actually let's come back to this scientific method. Yeah, let's go. Um, so let's talk, the last thing I want to talk about today, hopefully this was helpful and just a basic, I'm not going to go into lots of examples or anything, except apparently all about alcohol, <laughs> but um, I want to just talk through again with the scientific method. What if you're not gathering your own data? What if you can't get death rates across the country um, for the current thing that we are all operating under, right? We're all questioning or wondering about. What if you can't survey 100,000 people or see the hospital records or the autopsy reports for deaths, right? You can't do that. What can you do? And what can you do every time you read a research study? Almost always, if not always, if you go not to the, what does it call it? The abstract, which tells you about the research study or the conclusion paragraph in which the research tell you what they conclude, but actually go to the data. It is very, very rare in a peer reviewed journal, probably impossible to publish a study with falsified data. Um, there's, I mean, just people get in trouble for that you keep it somewhere. So you may have an unethical um, study set up, but most of the time they don't actually have to set up the study poorly. They actually just have to write in the conclusion paragraph a conclusion that is biased because no one reads the data. So if you go to the actual data in a scientific report, or you go to the CDC website and look at the actual numbers. Now, we did have a time where deaths were being reported wrong, um, and it was death with COVID instead of death by COVID, right? Um, that's been corrected. You know, you have to be aware of those things and if they're happening. But in general, um, you can usually find pure raw data in which you can complete your own complete scientific method. Ask a question. Easy. What is your question? What do you want to know right now? Do you want to know about health in your children with certain situations at school? Do you want to know about how 5G towers are affecting your life? Do you want to know about um, is alcohol affecting you? Even go to the current events. This can be done anytime, right? Do you want to know how your, if you wash your pet, Every three weeks instead of every six weeks, does it affect your child's asthma, right? Anything, anything that you want to do, you can ask a question about, right? The first thing is be curious. It's really nice to be curious. It is hard to be curious when you are in fight or flight. I think it's probably impossible when you are in fight or flight survival mode, right? So it's very important to get your body calm enough um, every day as much as you can so that you can heal, recover, rebuild your body, and also mentally think, um, explore, be creative, right? It's part of crawling out of the hole of what stress does to us is crawling out of the hole is actually thinking and being curious. Um, I'm curious about all the time. My current curiosity, I have two things. See if I remember the second one, but the first one is I am curious what vitamin C lesions look like. And I'm curious if some of the skin issues that I'm seeing that I think are detox spots or even some of the eczema that we're seeing. I'm curious how much of that in the in other medical textbooks, especially older ones, was classified as scurvy when scurvy was first studied about 100, 120 years ago. So I'm curious about that, right? So then I need to do research. And so what I've been doing slowly when I have time is finding research. I also am having other people do research for me by telling people about my very exciting question that I want answered. And someone already emailed me a thing that they found because they were bored the other day, right? And so um, you have to do the research, but like other people can help you dig it up. That's cool. Um, so I want to know if there are medical textbooks of descriptions back when we used to describe things a lot better than we do now, other descriptions about scurvy lesions. Okay. So once I'm done with the research phase, I'm going to create a hypothesis. Not hypothesis. In this example, we're just going to go with that. I have resources. So 
the hypothesis is that this certain type, like these categories of skin, and I would take pictures of them, are scurvy lesions. So then I would form an experiment. And my experiment would be every time I see a, a lesion, skin something that looks like one of my pictures that I think are scurvy pictures, I would then do something like test vitamin C level in the tissue or you know, whether, whether it's running a biofeedback or having someone muscle test or whatever, right? So I would test for vitamin C deficiency, or I could look at other vitamin C symptoms. Like, do they have type reflexive joints? Do they have gingivitis and their gums are bleeding? Do they have bloody noses or easy bruising? The things that we know are scurvy and in this, right? So then I could do that without doing lab or anything else. In my own practice, I could observe, they have these things that I know are vitamin C deficiency, and are the skin lesions present, right? And then I would say yes or no, vitamin C deficiency is present and is a skin lesion present, right? And then I would start gathering data to see, do skin lesions and other vitamin C deficiencies always correlate, correlate 50% of the time, right? And then you start gathering data, that's super great. At some point, so you need to design an experiment. That experiment I'm describing is much less um, empiric data and much more, uh, can't remember what the other word is right now. Um, just more, you know, connection, right? Correlation data, right? So the best way would be for me to test, to take a biopsy of tissue um, near the area that the skin lesion is to see if it is deficient in vitamin C. That might be a way to do it, right? Very empiric. That's pretty painful. I'm not going to do that. I don't have the resource to do that. And that would be, no one's going to let me do that to their kid, right? So there may be other ways to design that experiment. The other way you could do is if we give high dose vitamin C, not ascorbic acid, vitamin C to these people, um, do their skin lesions heal over the next three months or six months or whatever, right? So you can also design experiments to change something and see what happens when you change something. So if you, back to our other example, drink alcohol every night and didn't sleep well, you could try not drinking alcohol and see if that fixes it. You know, if, does that make a change in what it is, right? So it doesn't have to be adding something or or that. You can also do that. And then to do the best kind of testing, you would want a test group, a control group, sorry, and a test group, right? So one, the control group, these 50 kids, we don't do anything different. They don't, I don't advise them on how to eat more vitamin C. I don't even tell their parents that they're vitamin C deficient. I just note that they have vitamin C lesions on their arm. What I think are vitamin C, right? It's a hypothesis. And then the other 50 kids, I tell their parents to um, what foods contain vitamin C and give them a supplement of vitamin C to see if it corrects what's happening, right? And then at the end of the six month period, you compare and see how many kids still have lesions on their arm and how many kids are gone in each group. And then you see if there's a statistically significant change in the group that supplemented versus the group that didn't, right? So that's a hypothesis that you and I could do. And then you analyze the results. Is there statistically significant difference? Was it the same? Did they both have as many skin lesions or did the test group have more or less? And then you draw a conclusion. I believe that this type, this picture of skin lesion is a vitamin C deficiency, right? And there's a conclusion. Now, conclusions are only there until they stop being proven true. So you may just have had people who happened to, in the control group, happen to also see, uh, figure out vitamin C deficiency and start eating vitamin C foods. And so they skewed your results because they also eat vitamin C, but they didn't tell you about it because you didn't ask because they're the control group, right? So there's things like that that we need to be aware of. Um, and that is why we do a repeatable study, right? So the first time, if you ever read research papers, the first time something is done, they will say, this is an interesting thing and more research needs to be done because you can't draw a principal truth from one research study of 100 kids. I can't do that. But I can draw something that piques the interest of my colleagues who then will do their study and see if my hypothesis proves true with their repeatable studies. So they do the study the same way that I did. They see if they get their same results. And then that helps to prove or disprove my hypothesis, which I'm happy about because I actually just want to know what's true. I want to know what's real. I want to know what it is. 
Uh, I don't want, I don't need to be right about this. Um, I want to know what's true about this, right? So there's a huge difference um, and it's very important. Truth is very important, right? Okay, so, oops, so sorry. Let me try again. I'm trying to get to this last side. So we can all do science. Reminder that hypothesis is, will be continued to prove true or your conclusion, your truth will be true um, if it's true. And if it is true, you will always be able to demonstrate equivalent results. You will be able to repeat this experiment and you will be able to observe the same results, right? So those are the three words. They're kind of not in a particular order, but demonstratable, repeatable, observable, or I've heard them probably the other way, observable, demonstratable, and repeatable. All right, so this is the last thing for you. What questions, I don't know if you guys can see the slides if I'm not back on it. What questions do you want answered in your life? And I have not been watching the chat. Okay, there is a chat if anyone wants to chat. This would be the time to do it. Um, you just need a Google. You just need to be logged in Google with YouTube. There's not a separate login. Um, and it takes about 15, second, 15 seconds to get to me. So, okay. So what do you want answered in your life? What about disease? Disease in your family. Someone keeps getting sick. Your kids are sick all the time, right? Um, your pets are itchy all the time. You have a health concern. You keep getting... When you move houses, something changes, or um, no matter where you live, this seems to keep happening. So what is it about, right? So your health, your pet's health, maybe you have questions about your career or the way that you do things. So this doesn't just have to be health related. Of course, I'm going to emphasize that. But what about, am I better if I do emails in the morning and sales calls in the afternoon or do vice versa, right? So you can experiment in your career. You could experiment with how you're more efficient or how you get things done or which things should not be on your to-do list or how much you can give and delegate to someone, you know, underneath you um, without losing, you know, control of the project, right? Um, where things start going out of hand and go in the wrong direction. Not that you need to micromanage, but that, you know, you're responsible for the decision. So how much can you delegate before it's, it's not okay anymore? How many days can you be absent from the office before your boss notices? <laughs> like you can experiment anything. Um, just, you know, if you lose your job, it's not my fault. Okay. So um, what about a subject? Um, maybe not one of the things that can be fun, which we need fun in our lives again, right? One of the things that can be fun for free, pick an experiment that's related to nothing in your life. How many birds come to the bird feeder when you do sunflower seeds versus when you do cashews? This is a great thing to do with your kids or yourself. How many ducks do you see on a rainy day versus a hot day? You know, like just use your brain in this creative way and it is so nice. It's really, really nice to be um, thinking this way. There's a few things it does. It reminds us that there are true principles and that truths do exist. Because that is a debated topic in our world right now. It helps you think about things that are not what is in front of you, right? We, we don't think about, we don't stop thinking about something unless we are thinking about something else. And a lot of us have an almost all-consuming, even if you're not watching the news, almost everywhere you go, you can't get away from certain topics or subjects that are very stressful for a lot of us. There's nothing stressful about which bird feed that attracts more sparrows and which one attracts more magpies, right? It's a way to do something with your brain that's not just Netflix and, you know, Netflixing or binging or whatever. So doing something with your brain differently. This is teaching your kids. There's so many valuable lessons about life, not just the creative thing of them exploring, which is so vital for them to use their senses and explore their world so they understand how things work. Um, spatical connections, um, consequences. If you don't empty, if you leave the bird feeder empty, no birds will come. That is a really important neurological development concept to teach your kids. 
Um, so there's lots of things like that, right? So it provides the opportunity to learn. And my mom loves the scientific method and science and, and clearly passed it on to me. But the ways that it has served me are astronomical because I look at everything curiously. I ask questions. I understand how to do research. I understand what a hypothesis is. It is a guess that you prove or disprove. You don't get your, you don't want to be married to the guests, right? You want the guests to be a guess. And then you do, you collect data to see if you're right or wrong. And you don't, you shouldn't care about the outcome. You should care about having the right outcome, right? If I think that this outcome is the right thing, I'm going to see it. I'm going to figure out a way to design an experiment with observational or, or study bias to make it come out the way that I want, or I will ignore <laughs> or ignore it, right? Maybe I'll get data and be like, it was a fluke, right? Which we've been doing that for the last two years in certain things, right? So it's not when you truly want to know the answer. And that is just so important. I do GAPS diet because I wanted to know the answer. I just felt like I should feel better than I did. And once I got introduced to some research about healing the body and leaky gut, then I started to get to, here's what the body needs. GAPS diet is a protocol that pulls together. I'm not saying that it's the only or the answer, right? But it is a observable, demonstrable, repeatable answer. And anything that heals the gut has the same components that GAPS does. For a change, meat stock and, and animal fat. Decrease stress, take out bad foods. That's always true. If you're going to heal the gut, that always has to be true. Right? And so that is a true principle. Um, and then the methodology of doing that true principle is GAPS diet, right? But the true principle is if you eat Doritos every day and nothing else, you will not have a healthy gut that will eventually break. <laughs> okay? Right? So that's a true principle. Um, so not only is this helpful to teach your kids and will serve them for the rest of their life and serve you for the rest of your life, it will give you opportunities to think about different things and to have other engagements. Um, this could be a great way. All the time, I have the conversation about, you know, what else do you do? What else do you do? And I have the conversation with myself. I'm, I'm bored, not because I'm not busy, but I, my brain wants something new, right? And how do you get something new? It's a lot of work to do something new. Well, ask a question, right? And this process actually would walk you into something new um, and walk you into a, a field of study you may not know that you are super excited about, and you are. So, okay. I am back. That is my PowerPoint. Um, if anyone is good with Max, please tell me how to fix so I can share the whole screen. <clears throat> and that is the scientific method and why science is good and what is happening with that. So, Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I don't see any questions, which is fine because I mostly was, I don't know, just presenting topics. But please um, consider this. Please consider this for your family. Share with your friends, especially with kids or especially ones that, you know, it'd be helpful to either do their, use their own data processing to prove their own hypothesis. It doesn't have to be your data. As long as it's raw data, you can use other people's data. Um, or just needs a different thing to think about altogether because we need we need this and we need to teach it and we need to fight for true definitions of words. <clears throat> I constantly fight for this in any way I can in, you know, talking to people, correcting people. Same with empowered. I keep empowered. I want to empower people. It's our mission statement, um, vision statement on Be Well Clinic's website. It's been our vision statement for a long time. People go, empowered is so overused. I don't care because I am using empowered correctly. And I'm going to take back and fight back for definitions of words. Because when you start defining words differently, you actually, just in the same way, don't have a leg to stand on. Just like when you mess up with science, mess with scientific process and you call science something else, the science is settled is a lie. Science is never settled. Principles are settled. A principle will always be true. Science is never settled. Science, by definition, is asking questions and proving hypotheses or disproving hypotheses. So that phrase is a lie. Principles are always true, but science is never settled because science is just a process to determine true principles. So we need to be in that. We need to be fighting for those definitions. I, 15 years ago, 
saw that they were changing the definition of science. And it, I started talking about it then and it put up red flags. I never thought we would be where we are. None of us did, but not this far, right? This fast, this far. But I saw this happening 15 years ago. And I knew that they were changing the definitions of quarantine, of scientific method, of science, of uh, immunity. Like there's all these things that they literally are on the online definitions, like dictionaries changing the definitions. Um, so one of the books that I would suggest in your library is a dictionary. Never thought you'd have to go back to that, right? But I do suggest having a dictionary um, because to do scientific method and to find true principles, we need to define them in a definition that does not change. Um, so that that is, okay, I'm done with my soapbox, but that is that. And I hope that you enjoyed this. And I hope that you are inspired about scientific method. I'm going to be writing this up in a blog post, hopefully published in the next few days. So that'd be another way to just kind of take the points that we talked about on the PowerPoint slide and put them in a very basic thing. So feel free, please check out our blog. Uh, bewellclinic.net and I will see you all um, in our next webinar in a couple weeks and well the the newsletter will be going out for that soon.